welcome to The Politics of Survival. I'm your host, Dara Reed. We have a very special show tonight. Um, I was able to have a conversation with Victor Boot, who is the currently the deputy of the Legislative Assembly of Yulanovsk um, of the Savage Conovation. Uh, Victor had entered um, the USSR Military Institute, he is Russian, the Mi Ministry of Defense in Moscow. And upon completion of those courses, he went to Mozambique and was a military advisor and then later became an entrepreneur. His activities continued until his illegal arrest in 2008 when he was extradited to the U United States and held until 2022. Um, Victor returned to the Russia with the assistance of the Russian diplomatic mission after being exchanged for American basketball player Brittany Greiner who was convicted of drug smuggling. On September 20th, 2023, he registered as a deputy of the Legislative Assembly of the Yudvinsk uh, region of the 7th Conviction and in the regional electoral district from the LDPR political party, the Liberal Democratic Party of Russia. He joined the Committee of Industry, Con Con Construction, Energy, Transportation, and Road Management, as well as the Committee on um, Food Policy. And so that is Victor now. He was very demonized in the Western press. He was called uh, the Merchant of Death. There was a major film um, called Lord of War that Nicolas Cage starred in that was supposed to be loosely based on his life, which is um, very fictional. In fact, and in the conversation, uh, Victor talks about um, the way the Western media went after him and the amount of money that was spent to apprehend him and hold him in the United States. Now, what's interesting about our conversation is not only how open-hearted he is and, and just very direct about his experiences, but also how he doesn't seem to hold any grudge against Americans. In fact, he talked very highly about Americans. This conversation probably I couldn't have even had um, in the United States because of the way our First Amendment is being trampled on by the Biden regime. And I feel very lucky. I'm under political asylum, as you all know, in Moscow, Russia. And since I've been under political asylum, I am free to do my work um, without being worried about authorities trying to stop me. And that's very interesting indeed. And I want everyone to please try to come to this conversation with an open mind. And bear in mind that um, Western media is very heavily propagandized. Try to think for yourself. You may or may not believe him. You may or may not believe me. But think critically and think for yourself and pull from a lot of different sources and create your own decision about what you're about to hear. And that's all I ask. Come with curiosity. I think curiosity is one of the very things that can save humanity simply by keeping us from being isolated and xenophobic and biased towards others. And um, what I have come to find out is the beauty of Russia and how much propaganda was give, being given to me in the U.S. and untruths about Russia and Russian people. And this is yet another conversation with a Russian um, that really demonstrates how generous and how open-hearted they truly are. So that was my takeaway. Um, also, you know, my heart is heavy that there's so much rhetoric about moving us towards a global conflict. I hope that does not happen. I hope that the NATO hawks and Macron and the Biden regime stop the warmongering. And I hope that um, there is a ceasefire, a permanent ceasefire in Gaza, and that there is relief for the people that are being so besieged and starved to death, literally. Um, you know, there's been so much war and so much carnage under the Biden administration. Now, I know that the hearings are going on and my attorney filed a letter with the hearing committees in America that I am willing to testify remotely about my experience of being targeted by the DOJ and FBI on behalf of the Bidens to keep me from testifying about the truth. So thank you for showing up here, because by showing up here, you're going to hear other people's truths, not just mine. And again, come with an open mind and an open heart and curiosity. That's all we ask. Welcome, okay. Victor. Welcome to the Politics of Survival, and uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Tara, for inviting me. 
I'm very pleased to be with you on this show. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, so I had mentioned to you that I got several people already asking questions, all kinds of questions, actually, and some in, along the lines that I wanted to talk with you about. Um, and as you know, um, with the politics of survival, we, we, we talk a lot about international geopolitics, and you're, of course, a, a figure in, in internationally. Um, so let's start from the beginning and um, explain how you came to end up being in the United States and then what followed um, with the imprisonment and then the prisoner swap. Well, uh, uh, you know, I guess uh, let's start with some, uh, bring that same situation to the present day, okay. you know, environment. So let's say there is would be American businessman who would be, you know, having a contact from his old acquaintance somewhere else to selling, hey, you know, there is was a deal, uh, you know, about the selling of airplanes. Then he invite, uh, you know, this American businessman uh, to some country, let's say uh, uh, something like Azerbaijan or somewhere else. He arrived there, so the, they said, yes, we're willing to purchase the airplane. But you know what? We belongs to this Ukrainian, you know, organization who uh, needed also some armaments to kill, uh, uh, you know, Americans, uh, to kill Russians in, uh, you know, Donbass and Zaporozhye and Kherson. Would you please, you know, uh, supply us necessary weaponry? So, and then the gentleman said, look, I'm not a, uh, you know, arms dealer, you know, yeah, basically we, you invited me to talk about airplanes. Now this switch and bite, you know, deal when somebody trying to sell you a Brooklyn Bridge, whatever, you know, you said, okay, whatever, you know, what, what really you need or, you know, I just want to finish my deal with airplanes. So it ends up to be kind of this thing operation that this person would be arrested and then immediately uh, try to be coerced to go voluntarily uh, back to Russia to face the prosecution for conspiracy to kill Russians by agreeing to talk to these you know, Ukrainians who is not in fact Ukrainians, who have been a undercover Russian agents and the entire crime was invented by the uh, Russian government. Otherwise, it would not exist. Right. Think of this, what kind of the outcry would happen of the innocence and loneliness and uh, all the kind of brouhaha we used to hear, uh, you know, from the uh, so-called uh, defenders of democracy in the West. Yeah. So this exactly what's happened to me. So I found myself in the Thai, uh, Thai jail arrested for the in, initially, by the way, the charges being a uh, the support of terrorism, according to the Thai law, because no extradition request from the United States was done. So in one month, Thai authority releasing me from the jail where on the door of the jail, I am again rearrested, this time on the extradition request from American government to face prosecution inside the United States because I'm agreeing to talk to these undercover agents who are not really FARC people because the main charge was as a conspiracy to kill American officers in Colombia by agreeing to supply them the arms which might kill them in Colombia. So when we went to the trial in the Thai court, the Thai judge looked on this and said, hey, hey, hold on. Uh, who was this people who talked to Victor? Oh, this been our DA agents. Fine. So they've been fake? Yes, fake. Okay. What kind of evidence you got? You've got a recording. Okay, where is this recording? Oh, it's in the United States. So the judge telling to the agents, are you deed operation inside our territory? Did you obtain a permission? No. Where is recording? Why it's not a part of the testimony in the Thai court. No. Then the DA agent pushing the Thai judge telling him, hey, you know, it's not your business. What for you is important? There is an extradition request. You must just satisfy it. Doesn't matter what is there. The, the just mere, you know, document is enough for you to send him our way. So judge refused. We went for trial and I was acquitted. So extradition request of United States government being denied. Then, uh, of course, they filed their appeal 
And after one year, when they realized the chances are, you know, very slim, they even open sent another extradition request, this time for the bank fraud, because allegedly there is a, was some deal of purchasing by Tajiki company, some other place where I was involved, and this somehow, uh, com, you know, was the charges of the bank fraud. So then they, when we've been waiting longer and longer before the appeal court ruled out, uh, you know, you remember in 2010, there is, was a kind of the uh, uphill or kind of revolution in Bangkok, where the Bangkok was in the fires and uh, there is, was a clash with the protesters, police was on the streets, smoke all over. Exactly on that precise moment, uh, appeal court was gathered and not full panel like supposed to be because previous judge decision was done by the full bar. So all judges, you know, come together and ruled out that yes, uh, your arguments are right. There is no actual crime. This crime would never exist uh, if uh, this would be a, uh, you know, uh, because it was orchestrated by the government right. and, and, and how, you know, and from there on, you know, but, uh, in this time, it was only three judges who been apparently when entire Bangkok was under the lockdown, convening to appeal court, no doubt I supposed to be extradited by changing the facts. Though the appeal court in Thailand for the extradition cases, according to their procedure code, are not supposed to change any facts. They just have to check if, if the ruling of the lower court was right, not to change the facts. There, they uh, first time in uh, their you know history changed the facts, stating or oh, no, this was a uh, stuff or whatever. And when the judge read this decision, he immediately uh, tell to the lawyer file the appeal in this case. So we filed the appeal to Supreme Court, and Supreme Court because of uh, you know so you know huge violation of their norms accepted our appeal. And then was a tug of war between the influences who does what and more. And it's lasted, uh, you know, at least another six months before uh, finally American tried to uh, extradite me. But I never was done with the court. Court has to sign a release note that they done all legal procedures with me. And we've been still having a three hearings on Supreme Court for, for exactly the same manner when this illegal handover or kidnapping of me was happening. Legally, I was not extradited from Thailand because Thai court never finished with me. Oh. You know? Okay. Yeah, that's what's happened. So uh, then, uh, you know, uh, finally, you know, I found myself, uh, even the director of the jail where I was held. Uh, refused to let DA agent inside the jail. And guess what happened? The uh, that time chief of the uh, penitentiary system of Thailand walked in the jail to said, okay, you are dismissed for three days. I'm uh, stepping on as a director of this, uh, you know, uh, jail. And he, you know, let the DA agents took me from the jail. So uh, that's what happened. And then afterwards, for several years, there is, was a legal you know, problem in Thailand with this illegal handover of me because I was not properly extradited. Then I uh, you know, ends up, uh, after being flown by private jet on the cost of American taxpayers, almost for 22 hours, all the way through to the, uh, you know, uh, New York, White Plains. You know, then I found myself in the infamous and thanks God by now closed down MCC where we uh, went to the public defender you know on the first arraignment and then entire you know this enchilada start of the legal procedures and uh, as you know conviction rate in uh, southern district of the world not of the New York actually is a hundred percent there is nobody being acquitted for the, you know, and how dare they are even criticized, you know, any other justice system where this one is nothing more than just a conveyor of conviction. Yeah, you know, that's a way uh, to put it, conveyor of convictions. 
Um, and the main stuff the, the, is the, a conspiracy, Tara. You know, when I talk uh, uh, here in Russia, even our most uh, prominent uh, lawyers has a difficulty to grasp a concept of this conspiracy. You know, conspiracy, yeah. accordingly to my own judge, who gave an instruction to the jurors, you know, the instruction was done as such way. Conspiracy, it's a crime, including non, uh, it's agreement to commit a crime, including non-verbal one. So basically, win, yeah, uh, win-win will make you, you know, part of conspiracy. What you need, you need the two co-conspirators and one, you know, secret informer. And whenever he says or frame you up, and there is no legal defense against it. And guess what? If you check, at least in Federal Bureau of Prison, it's around 65% charges are conspiracy charges. Why? Because it's very easy for police, for DA, for anybody else to frame up a person by conspiracy. It's very low bar. You don't need a forensic evidence. You don't need to get, uh, you know, really caught the person by trying to attempt commit the crime. You just, you know, very widely, you know, uh, frame the people. And you remember, uh, it was very famous one because I was in the United States inside the uh, USP Marion and Southern Illinois, was watching TV, especially uh, 14, 15, 16, 17, or maybe up to the 18. Every two weeks, Government will announce that they busted some, you know, uh, group who tried to explode the synagogue, who tried to do, you know, uh, explode the bridge, if you remember, you know, all kind of terrorist activity right. where they would say, oh, after two years, government was, you know, uh, look, uh, watching these people and, you know, 330 times trying to convince them to commit the crime. Uh, look on those cases. They're all would neither, never exist if government would not try to orchestrate in dirty way. The people would refuse for the years, you know, to, to do some some of this shit. But they would go, please take money, please go and explode the synagogue, go and blow up this bridge, go, 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 go. You know, what kind of, uh, you know, this law enforcement? Yeah. They And they are busy because it's easy. They can get their, you know, kind of career boost up by, you know, it's a very... Uh, sound splash in, in uh, headlines all over. Oh, you know, the DA department caught a conspiracy to kill many people to blow up a bridge. So the brave, you know, uh, DA agent actually prevented the crime. No, they created the crime and they don't really do nothing to prevent even single fentanyl death in America. Why? Because, you know, to, to go and really clean up the mess they left with their, you know, drug enforcement policy and why they even call drug enforcement. That's, it's like, you know, obvious. So they're enforcing drug on the American population. They are part of the global conspiracy to kill American population by swarming them with the illegal, you know, fentanyl, illegal, you know, all kind of the other drugs. And they do nothing to stop it. They actually regulating it. They're removing one cartel, arresting one, you know, cartel boss from Mexico, just to let another cartel to operate freely. And then it goes, you know, every several years, you know, just replacement of the of the players. But who? Yes, yes, and that and that is being uh, that is being documented, and it's been ex it's being exposed, um, but not enough. It's still happening. And you know, one of the things I wanted for for my audience to know: How long were you imprisoned in the United States? Look, uh, in the United States, uh, totally, I was arrested in the uh, uh, March 6 of 2008, mm -hmm. was legally transferred to uh, United States, to New York, at the uh, November 17th, uh, 2010, uh, you know, and was a swap for the Brittany Griner in December 8. Uh, 2022. So I almost fell totally in jail, almost uh, 15 years short of three months. So in the United States uh, jail, I spent, uh, you know, 12 years uh, in six months. That's a long, that's a long time. And, and what I want to, what I want to do is frame this in a way so the audience who may not know you, um, particularly the younger folks, um, 
may not know you. So I wanted to kind of bring them up to date. There was the, the US government really focused on you, focused a lot of energy, a lot of fine money um, to apprehend you um, and uh, extradite you, et cetera. Um, and uh, I know from personal experience, when you're a target of the DOJ and FBI, um, one of the things they like to do is smear your reputation through the media because of all the tentacles that they have, particularly these days in the, in the media. But back in your time, one of the things that happened was that they even made a Hollywood film called The Lord of War. They, they gave you a nickname, The Merchant of Death. I mean, they, they really villainized you and marginalized you. And I had a couple questions from some of the audience members, like what, why was the US government after him? So, and why were they calling him this? And what, what is this? So there are those who, who really don't know your story. So I, what I wanted to do is ask you from your perspective, what was the impetus for the, you know, the American government to focus on you and then try to apprehend you in any way they well, could? Well, uh, let me start with some simple facts. During the trial, government's supposed to disclose all money they spent on this case. It's a special kind of, I don't know, disclosure, whatever, number 3000 or whatever. So they brought the file and then when I look at the file, I was aghasted because uh, they spent on this operation over $15 million or oh, $150 million to catch me. They just paid of tax yeah, of money. taxpayers' money. Apprehending okay. one person. Okay, go on. Yeah. Okay. And I look on this and to said, hey, guys, what you did? Where you went? You went once uh, in a trip to Curaçao. Uh, one trip in a uh, Ro uh, Romania and one trip in a Booker, uh, in a Thailand. That's it. For the three trips, you spend 150 million dollar. Then there is was a uh, you know they pay to these two con con conspirators, uh, the two secret agents who participated, who pretended to be a, uh, a FARC agents from Colombia, 15 million dollars. Give me a break. For the DA officer who is uh, getting what, 100 and maybe 40K a year to pay to his stooge, who 100% depend on his livelihood from this handler or babysitter, $15 million. Believe me, you know, somebody needs to do the checkup and figure out where this money goes. 100% not to these stooges. So why you and they said, oh, yeah, it was dangerous when he entered to the meeting with a Victor boot. Uh, he might never come back alive. I said, hey, did I have been armed? Did I have any record of killing anybody? Did I am a crime boss? And judge says, no, there is no any evidence that I ever commit any crime. The judge recognizing the ruling that I was just businessman who framed. She and you can see her interview to give her, you know, uh, credit where it's due because she has enough courage to step in and to say, hey, this guy just was framed. Unfortunately, I cannot do less than give him minimum sentence guide of 25 years for crime which has really didn't commit. Well, if you talk about somebody their, involved. Part of their focus on you because you were a Russian citizen? Or what? Well, I guess, look, this is a number one. I think there is, a, it's a, like a cake has a several little layers. Okay. For sure, there is a corrupt DA group who making money by going like a circus show or like road show, framing people. Because the same group frame exactly with the same scenario, exactly with the same agents, you know, secret agent, 12 more people. Before me was one uh, Syrian guy uh, who, uh, who uh, named uh, Al Qasar, Manzor Al Qasar, who is still, by the way, now in American jail, so, uh, you know, serving his 30 year sentence, which for him, with his age, it's almost like a death sentence or life sentence. And there is, was another 11 people. And guess what? Afterwards, on each of them, they spend huge amount of money the same way. It's nice. You're not really fighting a Mexican cartels. You just go find the people, associate them with the, this, you know, uh, YDA, because eventually CIA refused even to step in because said there is nothing. This guy don't do anything against, you know, he not plotting to kill Americans nowhere, you know. And then it, it goes there. This is the first layer. Second layer, in my case, because the, you know, when they start dubbing me a merchant of this because of book, uh, written by the Douglas Farrar and Michael Brown, 
who also ex-DA operative, okay, chief of the uh, Department of International Operation or whatever, you know, so everybody on this stage making money out of you because then they start demonizing you, then it's pick up by Hollywood or let's make the movie. And it's come to the most funnest possible way if you tell anybody, everybody loves on it, even on trial when the judge asking the DA agent, hey, what do you know about Victor Booth? Oh, what do you mean? I read a book about him and I, and I watch the movie. So... <laughs> oh my goodness. This... Huh? That, they this actually is, said that? They actually said that they... Sure, and the judge asking the DA team, do you have anybody in your team who speaks Russian? No, we don't need. We just has a Spanish interpreter. Yeah. And saying, you've been investigating Victor Boot and spent so much money, even without having a single linguist who understand all the, you know, Russian uh, part of even what you see on his personal computer. And then they blame me as a being a biggest arms dealer in the world. But they've been not able to produce a single evidence of the trial. So even judge has to rule that way that I'm a not a, there is no evidence ever that I was involved in any illegal arms trafficking. Wow. So they, and this is what we're talking about justice it, it must have, it must have felt like a nightmare did you feel like you were just in a nightmare at some point sure that's exactly it's like you're going to the hell and there is no recourse so you know you have just you know make sure pray to god and you know expect that sooner or later you know justice will prevail but uh, unfortunately i was not able to you know wait until this you know period when justice will prevail i just was tra trading for the britney griner that's it were you surprised when you got the news that 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 you were being swapped for Brittany Griner? Or was that, or did you hear rumors that there was something happening? That there was some. Look, uh, when uh, Brittany Griner's uh, been arrested, uh -huh. uh, she was arrested. I guess what uh, in, uh, uh, I think it was January two uh, thousand twenty two. Oh, okay. So then immediately the kind of the, you know, all commentators start to talk, oh, we need to start, you know, exchange her, blah, 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 blah. Then my name was, you know, mentioned. And then if you watch CNN, you watch Fox News and especially ESPN, starting from when she was uh, sentenced, this was almost daily, you know, kind of the, you know, news that I would be swallowed. For you know, Brittany Griner can be swapped for Victor Boat, can be swapped for this, can be swapped. So then you realize, okay, this may be chance. Plus, I was in contact with the, uh, you know, my embassy. Even ambassador came to visit me from DC, and he said, yes, we're doing everything to trying to return your home, including the swap. So I just was, you know, trying to, you know, pray God and you know keep uh, myself busy with something. And then one, one day, you know, finally. It, Four o'clock morning, you know, guards came with the boxes to say, pack up. I said, all right, I know what, what it is. So I just packed up. And... But, yeah, you know, 12, 12 years is such a long time. Like at any point during that time, did you feel like you were forgotten about by your homeland? Or did you always hold out hope? Or, or how did that work? How did you get through being in a, first, in a prison? Firstly, you know, since the first day I was uh, brought to New York, you know, our consulate general from New York was visiting me almost every week. And then uh, when they transferred me to USP Marion, when I uh, spent reminder of my time, you know, I would be constant uh, calls with them and they would try to visit me as much as they can. But when this uh, diplomatic war started in the end of the Obama term, then they uh, forbid or restricted our, you know, embassy staff to travel outside the DC. And then, you know, COVID lockdown. So, but uh, at least every couple of weeks, I for sure would having a call, you know, from embassy and they would, you know, intervene when it was a couple of cases when I would, but not able to receive a treatment uh, because I was extremely sick with some kind of the virus infection. And, you know, when I talked to my wife, she immediately called the uh, staff there and they intervened. And then finally, doctor, first time, you know, received me and gave me the antibiotics. Wow. 
So did you get um, books in Russian? Did you get a Russian interpreter? Were you provided in any of that um, during your time? No, I was not provided with a Russian interpreter. My, my level of English was, you know, pretty much enough. That's good. Uh, books, yes. Uh, you know, embassy also very quickly uh, sent me and subscribed me to receive a Russian newspapers. Uh, so I would stay in touch what's going on. And many, many people in Russia, and by the way, Many people in the United States would write me letters and would send me the books. So I've got a lot of the friends there who, by the way, one of them, uh, you know, Andrew Campbell even wrote a book <laughs> about our, you know, uh, correspondence. And uh, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it was a kind of the experience you definitely would remember. So I've got a lot of book uh, for these past you know 12 years in the United States alone I maybe finished reading like 4000 5000 books That's amazing And um as far as you know the smearing that happened to you in the western media and the labels you were given um that's pretty much the playbook as you know it's called the playbook it's like a PR move um where they really villainize someone marginalize them and you know one of the tactics of intelligence of course, is to take away your sense of purpose, your connection, right, to, to other people. Yeah, deprive your sense, uh, you know, like they said, let's, uh, this is a uh, psychologically very well explained. And by the way, this old research done by the, you know, Nazi uh, criminals in the concentration camp during World War II, uh, where they would torture, especially Soviet soldiers, to find out exactly how to do the shock therapy, how to deprive them from the stimulus, how to bring them with this, you know, hot, cold uh, noise, uh, deprived from the sleep, you know, and this all went uh, straight to the CIA playbook, how to torture without physically touch the person. Yeah, it's remarkable. And, and you know, that brings me to kind of an umbrella question for you. What, in your opinion, is, is the connection between what you're seeing, because now since you've been out of prison, I'm sure you're, you're seeing a lot that's going on internationally with, particularly in Ukraine, and um, the UN Security Council even had a discussion about illegal arms that are ending up in the black market that were meant for Ukraine that are ending up all over Europe with different groups, different individuals they shouldn't be with. Um, what is, in your opinion, is the connection between intelli US, I'm talking about US and British and Mossad, intelligence services and the international arms industry what where do you see that merging well uh, you know i'm not really uh, have a first hand knowledge about uh, you know how this going because in fact and uh, i never been involved in this you know black market you know weaponry transfers or whatever even the uh, weaponry i transported having a several airlines while i was doing this business it all, all was legit. In one country, they loaded with all official documents. Another country gave the all permission. You're just transporting the stuff. You are not responsible for the licensing. It's not a, you know, duty of, uh, you know, it's like taxi driver to know who is uh, your, you know, client you are carrying, correct? Mm -hmm. And especially if one country give you permission to land and load and, uh, you know, clear all the customs, give you the paperwork, and you bring to another country who says, okay, thank you very much, you know, uh, what I have to do with, uh, with all other, you know, related issue. They're not focused on the main. It's, a, it's a, they're always switching by tactics. Now, regarding my case, I do believe that United States, in my particular case, starting from 2000, start demonizing me. And on me, they really perform their uh, psyops uh, tactics. And then after me and my family, they went and started demonizing exactly on the same scenario, entire Russian Federation. Yes. We've been demonized. We've been brought, you know, will never see since maybe, you know, 2004, any positive news about Russia. It's all about corruption. It's all about, uh, you know, Khodorkovsky. Then it's all about Garry Kasparov. Then it's all about Navalny. That's it. They never show what the Russia really is, what's going on there, what we're achieving. Yes, of course, like any country, Russia do have problems, but we have a tendency to solve the problems. We are a way more safer country. Moscow considered it one of the most safest and most useful for the life 
megapolis in the world with a very perfect you know public system very you know very high tech advanced uh, smart technology based uh, you know society even our interaction with the bureaucracy if you have a smartphone like we are joking here with a smartphone you don't need to go to see any more government official couple you know presses on there as we joke we, you can't just make a baby on the smartphone all the rest you can do in <laughs> moscow especially in russia uh, dealing with this so and the, they never will talk about this it's all about demonization and now what's going on in ukraine it's just uh, on my understanding a final attempt of this globalist cabal who actually uh, occupied United States and, uh, you know, trying to destroy the Russia because Russia now, in fact, is a one country who stand up and fighting to defending not only ourselves, our freedom, because we've been, never been uh, under anybody control uh, and our sovereignty, but we're also defending human values. Look what they are pushing with this LGBT agenda with the transgender stuff. Look uh, what they're doing with this drug, deindustrialization, uh, artificially creating a replacement of population by letting illegal, uh, you know, illegal immigrants flood up the you know, southern border. Uh, look on the infrastructure of United States where how many 5,000 bridges are in critical stage required a urgent repairs. Mm -hmm. And then you start, hey, hey, hold on. Looks like United States are not only government, not only trying to fight Russia and destroy us, but they started from destroying their own people first. Yeah. By doing what they're doing to the people, destroying traditional American values, replacing the population, you know, removing means of living, yeah, putting all regulation where the huge transnational corporation uh, fighting a small farmers by suing like a Monsanto, yeah by infringing the patent law, by suing the poor farmers who dare to sell on pasteurized milk, which is huge as crime. And by the way, I've been with these guys in the jail who've been there because they sold unpasteurized raw milk and they sold the uh, cheese made from raw milk. Can you believe what kind of crime against you know, humanity is that? So we facing a satanist I, I had something. I had, I had something I wanted to ask you about that. My understanding, because I'm here in Moscow, as you know, um, under political asylum myself, and one of, and you know, I had been propagandized to believe certain things about Russia. However, I have a cousin who's Russian, so I had a different view. I wasn't, I'm not xenophobic, and I didn't believe some of the propaganda, obviously. So I was more skeptical of the stance of the Western. But one of the things I learned when I got here that surprised me is that Monsanto's actually outlawed here. It's not, it, it was by Putin, I think a few years ago, and they don't use, like in the, you mentioned dairy, um, in the dairies in the United States, they implement hormones into the meat and into the milk and into all that, which go into the human body, which has very bad effects, right? Um, but they don't do that here in Russia. Is that true? It's just naturally, everything's naturally organic, that all the pesticides and stuff are well, uh, you know, like uh, recent studies in the United States uh, in the sampling of uh, urine, almost all adult population has this, uh, what they call it, glu glucosate, uh, glufosate in the urine. Now, bovine uh, growth hormone, which they're adding to increase the productivity and all the uh, uh, antibiotics because the F FDA has to check all the benches of milk in the United States for the 28 antibiotics. And when they really kind of crossing the red line, they can't sell them. So majority of them, they end up to send them to the jail <laughs> eventually. I saw in the United States prison a box with the food which been labeled not for human consumption in the warehouse. Oh, wow. Okay. Now, concerning the uh, organic food here, uh, well, yes, uh, Russia are famous for that majority of our products are really can be classified as organic. Mm -hmm. Though uh, uh, Monsanto is really, I guess, one of the uh, arms of the globalist for destruction of the earth, because what they're doing, they genetically engineering some, you know, chimeras and, you know, the... Uh, stuff which they don't even realize what kind of consequences. One, I was reading a book about Monsanto and watching documentary. 
Do you know that in Monsanto canteen, the staff of Monsanto never ever would eat anything which Monsanto touches? This is one of the examples. Interesting. So here in Russia, there is a, also, uh, we are uh, now increased our agriculture production. And actually for past 10 years, we become one of the biggest, I think we are number four in the world of export of the food stuff. Mm-hmm. And majority of the food stuff can be classified as organic. At least you can, you know, testify to yourself from find hand knowledge, what kind of the quality we have and choices we have of the dairy products, of the meat products, and what is a vibrant, you know, food markets and what kind of the, you know, restaurant industry here. Well, and eventually... I, I lived on a farm when I was a kid um, in Wisconsin. So the food here tastes like it did when I lived as a kid because the food in America tastes different now. It's so full of chemicals and preservatives. Yeah. It's a look, look on this. When I was in jail, you tried to make a, uh, what you call it, the husks from bread. Yeah. And that bloody bread would not dry for the two weeks, even standing in open air under the ventilator. What kind of bread is this? It's never getting any mold. If mold would not eat the bread, how human can eat the bread? You see yeah. what I mean? It's as good as eating plastic. And the same way with the meat products they sell, which not require any refrigeration, uh, the sausages in the casing would stay the years, you know, on your locker on the hot temperature of the southern Illinois, and nothing happened to them. So this has, of course, come to the health of the future generation of American people. And look, for me, I spent these 20 years, uh, 12 years in the United States, mingle with a hardworking American. And I feel a lot of respect. I have a lot of friends. By the way, with many of them, I'm still who is now on the freedom, uh, keeping communication, who've been with me in the jail. And I really don't see why, because we as a Russians and Americans sharing a lot of common, you yes. know, with the same ways hardworking, with the same way, you know, generous and, you know, lovely people. And I believe we can have a very proper relation. That's what the President Trump tried to, to do. But unfortunately, you know, his swamp, you know, suck him too quick. He's not even able to, you know, uh, open the any gate to drain that famous swamp. Yes. And, uh, uh, you know, so and, and this is also attitude of many uh, Russians here. I, you might notice you've been here. Nobody come to you to say, oh, we hate you, because you're Americans. No. Yeah. We are still very friendly uh, towards the American. We respect a lot. We learn a lot from America. I learn a lot from this. And I believe in our history, we've been allied in several wars. Look how much Russia did for independence wars of the United States. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, you know, Imperatrice Catherine II refused to succumb to the British cousin request to send the troops to fight the rebellion in the United States. Alexander the first helped help the United States. Yeah, send the entire you know flotilla of the you know uh, sail sail ships into New York Harbor just to show the flag to the British. Hey, you know, don't mess up with this. You know, yeah. And you know now these days, I hope that American nation can you know organize its resistance and you know fight the globalists. At least we are fighting now with the arms. And I guess Russia will prevail in this conflict in uh, Ukraine, but it's not conflict with our brotherly Ukrainian nations. Because whenever somebody tells us, hey, you fighting, you invaded a foreign country. I said, foreign country? Do you ever see the war when the both sides in trenches are speaking in the same language? What is this? Exactly, civil war. And look how the uh, Ukraine appears. It's artificial formation, has nothing to do with this and and uh, as a United States was hijacked by the globalist for their purpose to destroy and what they're doing now they just literally you know uh, processing Ukrainians like a huge meat factory yeah I mean, with right. this is huge losses and there is no even a discussion hey guys you know let's stop this bloodbath let's finish it because look we have to protect our people. And now more and more it's going on, more Ukrainians will realize, oh, damn, you know, we better off to be Russians. Because if you remember, there is, was a Gallup poll in Ukrainian about something. So they give them the offer, okay, on which language you want to answer? 
And guess what? 80% of Ukrainians choose Russian to answer the question of Gallup research. So what kind of the nation it is if every 80% of them speaks Russian at home, having the same orthodox faith, we're eating the same food, we you know, throwing up the same joke, and now anybody telling to us, oh, you know, this is a foreign country. And let me tell you, Tara, another example. Let's say the Texan. Let's say some uh, 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 secessionist in Texas gonna, you know, come to power and said, hey, you know, we're gonna get the, some independence. Okay, it's happened, happened. Independence, Texas now independent. Then they said, you know what? We don't like really that we uh, speaking English. Let's name Te Texas Alan Twank as a Texan language. Uh, now, since now is called only the Texan language or the taught, but, uh, you know, more and more, you know, inclusion into this, some artificially made construction. Then we will forbid all the uh, normal English speaking people in Texas, even to speak in any public occasion, normal English. Then you have to speak Texan language everywhere. Then the government will refuse and courts refuse to receive your paperwork on the, you know, uh, English, only on Texan. And then of it, uh, the Texas will say, oh, now we want to be a part of the military bloc with the Russia and China and open their bases there. What American nation will do in this case? Exactly. And I, I think that point's been made, but, but obviously, you know, NATO has expanded. 2014, there was the coup. Victorian Newland and Western powers were behind it. Julian Assange famously exposed that. Um, as a publisher, and now he's paid for that with his freedom and and maybe his life, as we're witnessing a slow motion execution as they keep him in jail. Another example of an of a of a in, you know international extradition of a non U.S. citizen being accused of a U.S. crime. It's it's really been amazing for lawyers to look at this and try to figure out how the U.S. keeps trying to persecute. Um, foreigners under their law um, and use the uh, Espionage Act to do it in extradition. There are only two countries actually that don't extradite to the US and that's Iran and Russia. Um, so luckily- I'm And China to too. Um, China, I believe has some sort of an agreement. So that I was told that there's two countries that will not and it's Iran and Russia. Yeah, you see, it's in Russian constitution. We do not extradite Russian citizens, doesn't matter what. You bring the case, if it's they commit a crime, you know, there is a legal uh, you know, procedure which must happen here. He would be punished, which, by the way, was happened, you know. Yes. So, so I wanted to ask you another kind of bigger global question. Um, what you're doing now um, with your life here in Russia, but also I wanted to connect it to um, some of the things that I've seen that are pretty exciting that are happening in Russia in that, um, you know, although there's been thousands of sanctions, 16,000, I think, on Russia, um, it's actually the economy's grown 3.7%. The, the growth has been significant and, and more than Europe or, or America. And um, they've focused inward. And you talked a little bit about that. But they've also connected with BRICS and they're connecting economically, um, creating the Silk Road again. Um, China, India, South Africa, and the African nations, different African nations. And the different African nations are starting to kick the colonial power, powers out, like France, like America. So I wanted to, to get your views on what you're seeing, because it kind of seems to me that Russia's moving into this multipolar world as a leader of the multipolar world, one of the leaders, but, but letting other countries be their sovereign selves. In other words, they're not going into African nations and destroying them and just reaping their, their you know, resources. They're actually helping so that they can have trade and economic ties with these nations and let them have you know, their own sovereign rules. So what, is, is that kind of the feeling that you have and, and how does that tie into to all the projects that you're doing now? Look, uh, the uh, BRICS countries plus uh, so-called Global South now represents more than three quarters of the world economy. Anything which is happening uh, in the economy, in infrastructure, in the cultural or economical development, or, uh, you know, real growth and prosperity, it's happening in these, you know, three quarters of the world. 
whether the globalists want it or not, new and uh, uh, fair world order are setting in. The question is, if they would be willing to be in the present, uh, present on the table to discuss the new rules you know, and norms of international law, which they throw out of the window yeah. by grossly violating it, it's up to them. But these processes and these will happen whether they wish it or not. Of course, they would not uh, leave without fears resisting and trying to ignite global uh, you know, nuclear exchanges and so on. But I do believe that within the United States government, enough you know, real patriots, enough real uh, people who understand that the humanity future on the stake, and they do the right think when the right moment comes to prevent that uh, global suicide. Because I do believe that this Satanist cabal, which is ruling the world now, are suicidal. Look on the European governments, you know, these leaders, all of them childless. They don't care what's happened after them. They don't have a kids. They don't dream about their future. For them, eventually, the global suicide is like an occult. It's the best service and sacrifice they can do to the Saturn to whom they worship. And look uh, what's going on in a Russia or other countries where normal family are encouraged, where the kids are cherished, where no uh, transgender procedures allowed on the kids without, you know, they grown up or, you know, uh, come to the, to the mature age. And where the environment are uh, peaceful. Look, we just uh, finished the election of the president. All right. And despite I've been a, a very active member of the opposition political party, LDPR, founded by the Vladimir Zhirinovsky, you know, we very actively participated, uh, despite we, from beginning, knew that majority of population going to vote for the uh, President Putin, not for our candidate, but this was a freedom and we have to do everything to promote. It's like in sports, you have always practiced democracy, otherwise you're going to lose it. Okay? Mm -hmm. So look how, how wide discourse are happening in Russian media. I mean, we don't have a talking points distributed among everybody. Our, you know, range of the news and discussions are very wide. Yes, there is a couple of channels who maybe really focus on the pushing some, you know, kind of this, uh, not that this. But overall, uh, you know, it's still a very libertarian, I would say, approach. If you are not uh, infringing or, uh, you know, uh, damaging anybody else's freedoms, you're welcome to discuss the points, which is coincide with the traditional Christian values, which is coincide with the traditional values of the people who lives here in Russia too, whether I'm talking about Muslims, whether I'm talking about Buddhists, whether I'm talking about Jews, you know, we all uh, sharing the same norms. So, and nobody here would be allowed to go and insult the Muslims or insult the Buddhists or insult the, uh, you know, Jews by, because they uh, worship different, uh, though majority of Russian population like me are Orthodox. And, uh, you know, we have a many friends uh, who belongs to different denominations, but we all celebrating each other holidays. We invited to participate in religious ceremonies and it's all taken, you know, I've been many times in the mosque participating because they've been invited in the same way, you know, these people coming for wedding ceremonies in the church and they also participating. So we're living in a harmony with the Muslim and Buddhist in the Russia for at least past thousand years. Mm -hmm. And we know that you don't need to do the melting points and destroy the families or to, to be prosperous and a wonderful country. You just respect the other people, you know, beliefs and, you know, keeps your own tradition. And everybody uh, is proud in Russia to be Russians, despite we are 186 different nationalities and ethnicities. Yeah, I, and, and I have noticed that there is a peacefulness, um, like a hum of people just going about what they're doing. You don't have the racial 
um, divisions um, that you do. But of course, the US was founded on slavery, it was founded on blood um, and killing the native population. So, I mean, there is that history to the US and it's a, it's a younger country, whereas Russia has seen a lot more and um, has, you know, its empire has, has spread over, you know, a thousand years. So a um, thousand year history. So it's a lot more wise, I think, in, in some ways, um, collectively, right? Um, I wanted to ask you a couple of other things that I, you know, I, I was, I'm looking down because I'm um, trying to get it in front of me, but a couple of people had questions for you um, that had written in, and I thought, I thought a couple of them were, were interesting. Um, and it's up to you if you wish to answer or not. Um, but audience members that were really excited that you're going to be with us. Um, so let me ask a couple of that. Um, do you think that prison is worse in Russia or the U.S.? Unfortunately, I can't really be an expert on this because I never been in Russian prison, so I can't really <laughs> tell you any any. But what I know that they, for past uh, ten years, Russian government reduced our prison population uh, from one million. Now it's uh, lower than three hundred thousand. Okay. Uh, so there is a, a lot of efforts to reform. Uh, they did a very good job to reform juvenile, you know, system, mm -hmm. and it's a, and now what I know it's a lot of new uh, uh, complexes are built to replace the old uh, prisons and complexes which have been you know built like hundred years ago, and there is a lot of discussion how to make the system humane, how to make it uh, more functional and uh, how to keep a dignity and also allow the person to work and earn money. By the way, in Russian prison system, uh, if you have a skills and you want to work, uh, prison will only take 10% of the paycheck to you. Where in American prison, when I've been there, the, uh, the, usually each USP would have a factory, what Unicor factory, and they would maximum pay, if you work 12 hours there, maybe $120 a month, where your spending limit and your commissary is 360 So it's really continuation of the slavery. All other uh, jobs, like prison offer, which is a cleaning, uh, for instance, you know, this environment pays $10, $12 a month. What is that? Yeah. So... So, uh, so uh, as again, you know, of course, there is a lot of, uh, you know, attempts was made to uh, present Russian prison system like harsh on this. I'm honestly can't really, uh, again, testify it and I've not been inside, don't have experience. So I would rather, you know, say, look, I don't know. Yeah, there you have it. Um, so here's a kind of a fun question. What food did he miss most? What do you miss most? Or which meal were you most looking forward to when you got home? To Russia. Oh boy. Uh, first of all, uh, this is a kind of the torture. Even a uh, Thai jail, you can order any food outside of the prison. It was no issue. You know, you can eat whatever you want. Uh, they just, just check, expect, they order it for you from. You can then order the McDonald's, Pizza Hut, any Thai food, Chinese food, Japanese food. Just if you have money on your books, here you are. In America, you're never allowed to receive a single piece of bread outside the prison system. Right. They feed you with this so-called federal menu, which is exactly the same. For all time I've been there, you know, the Wednesday would be a burger day, the Thursday would be a chicken day, and the Friday would be a fish day. And it's dehumanizing. Yeah. Never have a food, uh, you know, prepared by your family. Yeah. I'm not allowed you to get any food which you particularly wish. That time when I was in the United States till, you know, the, uh, 2018, I was a vegan, never eating a meat, and I was suffering a lot by not having access to any uh, proper food. Uh, second, the serving and portion would be like, why on earth you don't let at least, you know, adult, big man, a decent size of the portion. You will be always half hungry after your chow hall with a, 
And then I realized it's again on purpose. Then you need to spend the money in commissary to buy some shit and fill up with the chips or whatever you want to you know, eat. And if you don't chips, it's your guy problem. So I would uh, survive on the dandelion salad I could uh, harvest on the lawns and being you know, punished for this because I'm harvesting a dandelion in a prison lawn, uh, you know, and, you know, trying to kind of supplement whatever would be tofu, I would be very happy to eat. So for me, uh, think of this, if you for all these uh, 12 years and more would never ever have a taste of the fresh strawberries, fresh garlic, fresh uh, spring onions, uh, I mean, name anything fresh, everything would be processed and brought and packaged. Uh, this would be in radiated food, which would kill. The chicken would smell like a funny fish, you know. The uh, meat would be, I mean, I don't know, but it's kind of the, you know, I guess America can do way better at least to feed its uh, prison population because right. it's, you know, it's it's really comparing to shows that uh, it's a food in a, especially... Uh, federal prison is more as a punishment than the, you know, your human right. Okay, that's that's really interesting. Yeah, it's uh, terrible actually. That that that's um, and I've heard that too. Um, and especially in certain regions of the United States, I think it even gets worse. Um, I was going to ask you um, this question from from someone from audience, which I thought was interesting. Um, it's kind of an existential question, if you will. What three things that you learned in, in your life that you think everyone should know um, and your biggest regret? Well, uh, three things I learned, you know, of this, that uh, you have to remain honest to yourself, first of all. Mm -hmm. When you're honest to yourself, you can be honest and uh, to others. Uh, never to surrender and never be, be feared of environment. Environment can be, you know, either your tutor or your tormentor. It's your choice. That's what I learned in the prison. I learned that the love uh, can break any, you know, walls and any distance. If you are, you know, uh, honest to your blood, if you're honest to your, you know, roots, never forget your roots. This is number two. And regrets, you know, looking back in my life, of course, there is a certain situation I wish wouldn't happen. But if you tell me regrets, regrets, I would say no. You know, bring it on again if you want to. So we are here with the, our creator purpose and we all have to go through whatever, you know, test he sent on our uh, way. And we shouldn't be a choosy ones. We have to receive everything with a gratitude, whether it's a, you know, success or it's a failure, where it's, a, you know, a huge achievement or like me who spent my 12 years in lockdown and lock up, but I never regret all my life as a whole because I'm a believer. You need to take everything, you know, our Jesus Lord send us with a gratitude. Well, that's, that's really profound. And, um, you know, I, I know that you are very dedicated to your family and they're dedicated to you as well. Um, you know, and I, I guess I wanted to ask you, getting to know you a bit through this conversation and another that we've had, um, what do you see now that you're in Russia and, you, and you've been here for a few months or actually longer, you've been here for a couple of years and you're rebuilding your life and you're, could you talk a little bit about what you're doing right now and how it is to be with your family again and to be in Russia, you know, in a way that we could kind of inform and educate the Western audience, but they don't know about Russia. Well, you see, uh, it's a huge experience. When I return, I become a member of this party and I've got opportunity to travel all over the country, meeting our, you know, people, talking to them. I was in a lot of meeting with the students. I was also had the chance uh, several times uh, to visit uh, the Donetsk region, Zaporozhye and Kherson and Crimea. Actually, I will go to Crimea very soon again. So now I am a deputy of the Ulyanovsk region, uh, you know, legislature, which I'm learning a lot how to be a deputy for the people. Uh, so this was a huge uh, 
you know, feelings overwhelming you when you return to the country and you understand you really returned because, yes, I was receiving a Russian newspaper, reading what's going on in uh, Russia. So many things for me was not surprised. I saw them in the newspaper. But when you come and you see the magnitude of these changes, how Russian, uh, you know, infrastructure change, what the Moscow city, St. Petersburg become. Even in Siberia, I went and, uh, you know, in Siberian city like Chita and was surprised how quickly that city is developing, how much was built as a hospital, uh, as a, you know, new uh, buildings, how much service has improved. And basically now all over the Russian, you have access to the same services that the Moscovites or people in St. Petersburg have. It's all internet trade. You know, where I'm sitting just from my window, I'm seeing these robots delivering a food and the purchases you order on your smartphone. So right. you pay everywhere with the quick payments in, uh, you know, the system we have, which is a, it's literally take a second, I guess, like 10 seconds if so. But, you know, and you sending money just by your number of the phone. Yeah. I would never ever imagine we have this, uh, you know, plus the fantastic like a taxi service. I mean, forget about Uber. You know, Uber is looks like a you know, you know, baby talk comparing what what's going on. Or look in this bus system, I know, metro in Moscow. You know, metro, yeah. how airports are done. You know, level of the service, how everything is clean, and you know, and especially I would drive on the highways they built, and I am amazed. You know how this all develop and what kind of the level and plus it's safe. I don't know any region of Moscow where you have any restriction. Don't, don't go there at night or there is some activity. I never see any peddlers or drug dealers or in fact prostitutes standing on the corner and trying to push or propose something. I would not say these kind of problems not exist here. Yes, they exist. But when you come, you really need to look for them before you find them. They are not widely available on your first demand. And uh, of course, a lot can be done on development, but we're busy in legislation trying to improve life of the people uh, because main complaints I'm as a deputy receiving is a, uh, you know, necessary repairs in the housing projects. They staying, you know, a, sometimes it's a shortage of the school uh uh, you know, shortage of the enough places in the school, capacity in the schools. Uh, also shortage in the kindergartens, you know. Uh, uh, but all countries, especially right now, are really united around the, our president, which got our vote of confidence with this latest uh, election. And this uh, campaign was really fair, really, you know, vibrant. Uh, so many details are discussed, and can you imagine that the your winning president would invite the you know all candidates, bring going with them uh, and the stage and say, hey, this all people participated, you know, I'm very gracious, and whatever idea they have, we're gonna use them, and that's actually what's happened. Look, we have a our you know Duma fraction of our party, not that numerous, but many, many, many initiative and the project of the bills we're preparing are actually finding a understanding from all a party of power or you know majority power party and they actually you know together with our deputies in a state duma you know working on them and receiving them and think unthinkable then in the united states democrats going to propose something and republicans say oh this is a good idea let's vote for it it's i never i never knew this if this ever happened it's like more divisive that. yeah and, you know, and I and and one final thing, you know, before before you uh, before we close our conversation, I wanted to to and it is on a serious note because we're in serious times. Um, Macron has just um, said that he is sending to two thousand troops to Ukraine, um, boots on the ground. Now the U.S. thus far, the rhetoric at first they said they would, now they're saying they're not. Um, however, they're sending money and weapons. Um, but if, you know, Macron has been very using his rhetoric, it's been increasing, particularly about Crimea, which is a red line for Russia. Um, they had a 97% uh, population that wants to stay with the Russian Federation. It is Russian. Crimea is Russian. Um, so now you have these elites trying to poke that, right? Um, push that red line. Um, are we close to a global conflict and 
do you feel like it can be avoided? And particularly with this move by Macron and NATO, essentially. Well, the Macron and NATO, uh, there is a two sides of it. By one hand, yes, we're very close to the conflict. Okay. Uh, this is why this conflict in Ukraine are not really called in Russia as a war. We're calling it a special military operation with a very limited, uh, you know, scope. And if you noticed, we never had the chance to hit any civilian infrastructure. And now, even comparing to Chicago or these civilian deaths per 100,000 of population in Chicago, like a magnitude of five or six times higher than in, the, in Ukraine, who's supposed to be in the war. Okay, this is regarding the adjective. Now, about the uh, Macron, uh, well, uh, famously, uh, once uh, after the, uh, during the uh, uh, Yalta uh, conference uh, during the World War II, uh, Stalin uh, was asked about the Pope and his role in the future, you know, uh, settlement in the Europe. The famously, Stalin said, how many divisions do the Pope of Rome have? And this is the same question to the Mr. Monsieur Macron. Uh, how many of division of soldiers you can commit and send to Russia? 2,000 to be a fertilizer for the you know, black soil of the Ukraine? Please send them. Mm -hmm. They already have been over the, you know, what, uh, close to 6,000 foreign uh, troops uh, killed inside the, this, you know, operation. Anybody who else come, you know, this is tradition. We have a famously Alexander Nevsky told whoever show up in our land with a sword will die from the same sword. There you have it. Um, but as we move forward towards what I've noticed with President Putin um, in, in some of his speeches, he's really talking about peace and trying to find resolution with peace and really seems more interested in economic innovation and future innovation for the Russian people, but also just in general. And um, I just wanted your view on this quote, this quote that he gave, because I think it's the quote of 2024. He was referring to the global cabal or to the elites um, and how they're making money off of death, basically. And he said, the vampire's ball is coming to an end. Yeah, that's exactly what is, what is happening now. And as again, we are praying uh, constantly mm -hmm. that the you know people who are with the, uh, within American administration, within French administration, within others, you know, NATO country administration, mm -hmm. uh, not all part of this global Satanist cult, and they're not all trying to commit collective suicide that not all of them don't have any kids or children and they don't care about future. They care. So we're hoping that there is will prevail enough uh, sanity into not going into crossing the final, you know, red line where we will have to go and all out war by protecting our sovereignty. Because again, when these countries openly announcing the target to destroy Russia, what we're supposed to do? If somebody coming and said, I'm going to kill you openly, you have to take it seriously. And we're warning them. And Mr. Putin was very explicit and his, you know, very moderate approach. If you uh, listening to his rhetorics, he is always very carefully choosing all phrases. So, and he whatever did. he's and saying. He said very famously over and over. And he also said it in 2007, he warned about the NATO expansion, but more importantly, like even in the Oliver Stone interview, he said, they asked him pointedly, who would win a nuclear war between America and the US or no. the powers and, you, and, and Russia? And he answered, no one. No one. But, you know, at least uh, this is a final, you know, ultimate, uh, I would say a break for those who are trying to go all out on this war against humanity. Yeah. But hopefully, you know, um, he'll st st he's steering the ship right in a, in a good direction. And I think all of us that are for peace and trying to, you know, move uh, friendship between countries, I think that our voices are getting louder. You know, those. Of yes. Us and, I, and you see, if you listen to what's going on on the American radio talk host, 
Uh, it's not like I'm trying to say they're pro-Russian. No. And we don't want to be people pro-Russian. We want to be pro-American. Because if you are pro-American, you do the right stuff. You don't want to have a nuclear war. If you are pro-American, you don't wa want to waste your money. You want to build your infrastructure. The same we here, we are pro-Russian. We are not uh, trying to go and, um, you know, min mingle with the what's... Again, they're going to now play the same old, you know, fiddle with the all Russian meddling in the election. But uh, I just wish to say and to, you know, translate to the audience our, you know, sentiments that we really do believe we can have a good friendship, friendly relation between our nations. We're very close. Uh, whether it's a territory, make Americans and Russians thinking the same, and we also, in the same level, looking forward that our kids would live in peace and prosperity. Well, on that note, I will close our discussion and thank you, um, Victor, for taking the time um, for, you know, educating the audience and talking about your experiences um, so honestly and from. Thank the you very much, Tara. I'm very pleased, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.